So this is the last talk of this, this afternoon. And the next speaker is uh, Roberto Melcangi. And it's a real pleasure to, to introduce Roberto, who is an excellent scientist and a friend. Uh, and uh, the title of his, uh, his talk is Neuroactive Steroids and Neurodegenerative Disorders. Because Roberto is an, uh, an associate professor at the University of Milan. He works at the Neuroendocrinology Unit of the Department of Endocrinology, Pathophysiology and Applied Biology. He's also a member of the Center of Excellence on neurodegenerative, <laughs> no, don't laugh, Roberto, diseases, and is a, is a, is a huge expert in, uh, in the field of uh, neuroactive steroids, which means all the steroids that are synthesized and acting at the central level in relationship, uh, I would say, with anything that has to do uh, with the effect of these steroids on, in the brain, and in particular in relationship with um, uh, brain diseases. Uh, we've been collaborating for a couple of years now, and hopefully we'll be still collaborating for a, a long time because uh, he has a, a huge expertise in this field which can be useful to everybody, all who's working in the field of neurodegeneration. So please, Roberto. much Fabio. Uh, I wish also to thank uh, Marco for the kind invitation. So we conclude this meeting. You, you know that usually to conclude a meeting is very hard because the people are very tired. <laughs> we are very tired too because the jet lag is still uh, divesting. <laughs> so, and uh, uh, I wish to talk about the neuroactive steroids. And uh, I wish to, uh, sorry, it's not finished, okay. So, the, the nervous system, I mean uh, the uh, central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, is a target of two different pools of the steroids. I mean, uh, uh, the classical knowledge is that the, st the brain, uh, the nervous tissue, is a target of uh, uh, the classical steroid hormones, I mean uh, the, the steroids coming from the peripheral gland and act on the uh, nervous function by the classical endocrine effect. However, now it is very clear that uh, the nervous system is also able to synthesize the steroids. Usually the term of uh, the synthesis of st the steroids in the nervous system is the neurosteroids. But uh, in uh, this terminology may be also very uh, a risk because uh, usually it is, it is difficult to discriminate whether the effect we observe is due to the steroid hormones coming from the peripheral glands or the, or the neurosteroids synthesized in the nervous system. So another term that I use personally is neuroactive steroids. So neuroactive steroids are able to uh, interact with the nervous function by autocrine and paracrine effect. To exert this effect, we have a uh, very different possibility. I mean, the neuroactive steroids may act by classical steroid receptor or non-classical steroid receptor. When you consider the effect of neuroactive steroids in the brain, this is a totally mess. I mean, the, this, uh, this field of research is like a Pandora box. <laughs> and uh, recently we have observed that what uh, is uh, uh, sure, I mean that the steroids act by a classical steroid receptor, I mean progesterone, androgen, estrogen, glucocorticoid, mineral corticoid, is not absolutely true. I mean, in many situations, the uh, neuroactive steroids are also able to interact with non-classical steroid receptor. I mean with a receptor like, for instance, for a neurotransmitter, like the GABA-E, interaction with GABA-E and GABA-B receptor, uh, receptor for glutamate, MDA, AMPA, kinate, and the receptor 
usually unusually receptor like the sigma-1 or the membrane receptor for the steroids. The 25DX receptor is only one kind of this receptor. Now we have also that is uh, particularly devoted to the progesterone, and now we have also other uh, steroid uh, receptor for estrogens or glucocorticoids. So the nervous function is not only a target for the action on your active steroids, but is also able to synthesize steroids. In, uh, since the 1960, uh, Etienne Beaulieu discovered the presence of the neurosteroids. This slide summarizes different steps of the steroidogenesis. And uh, in particular, what is important is that the substrate of steroidogenesis, the cholesterol, the first metabolites, which is the prenianolone, and then the formation of progesterone, dihydroprogesterone, or androgen and estrogen. However, it is also important to highlight that the progesterone and also testosterone, this is a situation of the uh, progesterone, progesterone may be also converted in a very fast way, and that is very important, because usually when the people consider the steroids, consider only the, sub the physiological substrate of the steroid, I mean progesterone or testosterone. But it is important to highlight that progesterone is converted very rapidly in further metabolites. These are not catabolic metabolites, these are active so, the hydroprogesterone, and then in alloprenianolone, tetrahydroprogesterone, or isoprenianolone. And uh, similarly, uh, testosterone is converted into the first metabolites, the hydrotestosterone, and in further metabolites, the pre alpha diol and the pre beta diol Because I mean that uh, I like that the metabolism is extremely important for the neuroactive steroids here. Because uh, when you consider it, the capacity to interact with the, uh, the receptor, I mean, for instance, the conversion of progesterone into its metabolites, the first metabolite, the hydroprogesterone, is still able to interact with the progesterone receptor, I mean, with a classical steroid receptor. But the further metabolites, I mean, isoprenialone and tetrahydroprogesterone, are able to interact with the GABA receptor. And as you see, this, uh, this enzymatic conversion are a reversible process. I mean, when you utilize the hydroprogesterone, we may have an effect with the hydroprogesterone itself, I mean, binding to the classical progesterone receptor, but we have also an effect by non classical receptor. Particularly, this situation is very complicated because uh, alloprenianolone is steroid, it's a potent ligand of the GABA receptor, it's a stimulatory why isoprenianolone does not bind directly to the GABA receptor, but is able to remove the stimulatory effect of tetrahydroprogesterone. And also the situation of the androgen metabolism is very complicated. I mean, the first metabolite of testosterone is dihydrotestosterone, and dihydrotestosterone, of course, is able to interact like the testosterone with the androgen receptor. But when you analyze the effect of the metabolite, the pre alpha diol and pre beta diol. The alpha diol is able to interact with the GABA receptor, I mean, similarly to the tetrahydroprogesterone, but is also able to interact with the receptor for the estrogen, particularly for the, uh, the isis from interest of the, of the, rece the estrogen receptor, and the same is uh, for the pre beta diol. So, I mean that when you utilize the steroids, you have to be very careful to analyze the metabolic pathway. And that is very important because, uh, for instance, the pharmaceutical chemi companies, when apply the therapy with neuroactive steroids, and uh, I will show you, there is no doubt that the neuroactive steroids are not only important by physiological regulation of the nervous function, but is also potent protective agent. So the the pharmaceutical companies, of course, do not utilize directly the physiological steroids, but utilize the, uh, the synthetic ligand or the receptor. So, for instance, uh, for the hormonal therapy using the monopause, it has been observed that, okay, the, the, the synthetic ligand may counteract the, the, the cognitive decline occurring during the menopause but also is able to increase the 
the incidence of the tumor for instance the uterine tumor so the reason is that the pharmaceutical companies have the synthetic ligand and they immediately utilize the synthetic ligand but what is very clear that you know for the basic research we now need a step back I mean we have to really understand what happens in the metabolism this step is a very important point in my opinion so as I told you neuroactive steroids are important physiological regulator of the nervous function I mean uh, the, the neuroactive steroids are able to, to affect the synaptic plasticity glial plasticity the neurogenesis also the tissue remodeling, remodeling after the injury and consequently affect many functions I mean affection, cognition, behavior, and also have uh, an important help in the endocrine regulation. But what is very important and very usual for the future is that the neuroactive steroids are also potent protective agents. Really, there is no doubt that the neuroactive steroids are protective agents. The problem is, you heard me? Okay. The problem is uh, to understand, really, the mechanism of action of these uh, steroids. I mean, this is only a partial list of the uh, neuroactive di disorder or psychiatric mood disorder in which we have observed a, a correlation with neuroactive steroids. I mean, Newman pick type C, uh, the diabetic neuropathy, I will show you some example. A traumatic brain injury, now there is a clinical trial in USA with the progesterone. Ischemia, multiple sclerosis, I will also talk uh, about this uh, problem. Alzheimer, Parkinson, etc. So, for instance, this is uh, our very uh, recent uh, results that we have uh, recently submitted. Uh, we have analyzed the effect of progesterone in uh, an experimental model of multiple sclerosis, uh, the experimental uh, autoimmune encephalomyelitis. And uh, in literature, there is some observation which indicate that uh, uh, these steroids affect the is a protective for this uh, pathology during the acute phase. I don't know if you are familiar with uh, this experimental model, but uh, EIE, the first phase of the experimental model, is more characterized by neuroinflammatory feature, while the chronic phase is more characterized by demyelinating feature, I mean, in general. And we have observed that the treatment with progesterone have a, a beneficial effect on uh, neurological score, but also there is still some neuroinflammatory feature. I mean, if you analyze, these, uh, these experiments have been uh, performed in a dark Gauti model that is uh, a perfect model to analyze both the acute and the chronic phase of the pathology. And also in the chronic phase, we still have an increase of microglial cells. We have uh, uh, determined the number of uh, M. AC2 immunoreactive cells and progesterone is able to counteract uh, this effect. Also decrease some cytokines like the interleukin like 1 beta, TGF beta 1 and TNF alpha gene expression and also increase the enzymatic activity of this enzymatic pump, the sodium potassium TPase pump. And uh, we have hypothesized in this experimental model because recently it has been uh, published that there is an inverse correlation which, is, which has been observed in demyelinating plaque of the multiple sclerosis patient between uh, the microglia and uh, the mitochondria. And uh, uh, we believe, we have hypothesized that uh, progesterone is able to affect the microglia re reactivity and consequently the production of ATPase and consequently this enzymatic pump. We have also uh, analyzed several effects in the peripheral nervous system. Uh, indeed, our main expertise is the peripheral nervous system. Only recently we moved from the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system. And what is very important is uh, to remember that the peripheral neuropathy may be due to different causes. 
I mean, one of the important uh, causes is, of course, the systemic uh, disease like the, the diabetes. Also, there is a neuro peripheral neuropathy in hormone imbalances, uh, like, for instance, the acromegalia, which is uh, characterized by an increase of the GH hormone, have also peripheral neuropathy or disorder with the thyroid hormones. Uh, alcoholism is able to induce peripheral neuropathy. Aging also in is able to induce peripheral neuropathy. So, for instance, this is the situation during the aging. We, if you can compare, this is the morphological aspect of the sciatic nerve in the adult animals and the, in the aged animals, uh, and uh, it is, uh, uh, it is clear, we, we clearly may observe that there is a, a strong decrease of the number of the, uh, myelinated fiber, and if you treated the animals with progesterone or the hydroprogesterone, tetrahydroprogesterone, you have a completely remyelination. So, these results clearly indicate that the neuroticeroids are able to affect the myelination pr process. These do, do not occur with the androgen, testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, and free alpha diol. In particular, we, uh, we have observed that progesterone, its derivative, are able to increase the number and the duration of the myelinated fiber, in particular the small diameter, and to reduce also the myelin abnormalities, the number of fiber with this anormality. So have a beneficial effect. If you consider another classical experimental model, I mean the crash of the, of the uh, peripheral nerves, and uh, in, this experiment, in this experiments we have uh, analyzed different parameters, I mean the expression of the myelin proteins. Uh, these are classical uh, myelin proteins, the glycoprotein P0, the PMP22, the MAL, or the myelin basic protein. We have also analyzed uh, this parameter, which is uh, uh, this enzymatic pump, so the uh, potassium ATPase, which is an important parameter of the nerve functionality. Or the relin, uh, the relin is uh, a protein, a matrix protein, which is, for instance, important in the central nervous system uh, in uh, the experimental model for the autism because it's uh, the responsible of the cytoarchitecture of the neuronal uh, pathway. But it's also important in peripheral nerves. I mean, uh, during the peripheral degeneration, we have an upregulation of this uh, uh, protein. The thermal sensitivity, I mean, the capacity to, uh, to fail the, the thermal changes and the myelinated fiber density. And uh, we see that the metabolites of progesterone is effective on all these parameters during the crushing, but is also effective the progesterone, but progesterone is, no, is not ef uh, effective on the myelinated fiber density. I mean, this is a further confirm that only the metabolites are fully effective on this experimental model. Another experimental model uh, for peripheral neuropathy is by the Doce Taxel. Uh, usually the chemic therapeutic drug also, of course, is, uh, is effective against the tumor, but one of the side effects, or the classical side effects, is the induction of the peripheral neuropathy. And also, uh, on this experimental model, the hydroprogesterone is effective on the myelin protein, is effective of the CGRP, which is an important biomarker for the neuropathic pain, is effective on nerve conduction velocity, thermal sensitivity, and also the nerve fiber density in the footbed of the animal. And uh, progesterone, I mean the physiological substrate, is only effective on these two parameters. Another experimental model is the diabetic animals. This is a classical uh, model for the diabetes, I mean the injection of streptozotocin. With injection of streptozotocin, we have uh, a, you destroyed the Langerhans island, and we have the common feature of the diabetes. Uh, all, I mean, uh, there is a high percentage of diabetic patients which have uh, with uh, the diabetic neuropathy. Indeed, in clinician, uh, for, the, for the clinician aspect, this is a very big problem. And uh, 
In this experimental model, we have analyzed not only the progesterone and the hydroprogesterone, but also the allopregnenolone. And as you can see, also in this experimental model, the steroids are in different way effective. So exert a protective effect. Uh, the situation with the androgens is a little bit different. I mean, if you consider the same experimental model and we analyze the effect of the hydrotestosterone, this is uh, effective on all these parameters, is less effective in comparison to the progesterone derivative. So what we now know that the androgen are affecting diabetes neuropathy, but is, is less effective in comparison to the progesterone derivatives. And the free alpha diol is only effective on, on a few uh, parameters, and the testosterone is only effective on the nerve fiber density. So at this point, I show you that it is possible to hypothesize a therapy for the central nervous system, but also for the peripheral nervous system based on the neuroactive steroid. However, it is very difficult to hypothesize a therapy directly with the uh, neuroactive steroid itself, because the neuroactive steroid itself, by systemic injection, may also evoke, of course, uh, some uh, side effect. Indeed, the receptor for the steroids are expressed everywhere, and uh, uh, usually is, uh, uh, for this reason, as I mentioned before, the people try to hypothesize the synthetic ligand. But with the synthetic ligand, we have the problem that the, uh, the steroids are metabolites, and usually we have not a single effect on the steroid receptor, but we have a cumulative effect on different steroid receptors. So another possibility could be to directly increase the steroid levels when you need the steroid level. I mean, this is, it is possible by, uh, actually, by utilizing two different drugs. The first drug is the TSPO. What is the TSPO? TSPO is the mitochondrial receptor, which is important for the translocation of the cholesterol from the outer uh, inner of the mitochondria to the inside of the mitochondria. The first step of the steroidogenesis I mean the conversion of cholesterol into pregnenol is, of course, in the mitochondria. So activating this uh, mitochondrial receptor, we have also a pathway which increases the steroid levels. I mean, in this way, you may, we hypothesize that we may avoid the systemic treatment with the steroids. I wish to show you some example of the effect efficacy of these drugs. I mean, this is this, the situation during the aging. This experiment will be performed in rats. This is what occurs during the, uh, the aging. During the aging, you have a strong decrease of the meninitis fiber density. And we have also this effect. This effect is a de daily myelination. I mean, you have the the myelin compartment that is not so strict. And when you utilize the, this, uh, this ligand, the RO54864, you have a compaction of the myelin membrane and the remyelination feature. So this effect is due to the neuroactive steroids? Yes, this effect is due to the neuroactive steroids because we have a measure in the sciatic nerve by liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, the levels of different uh, steroids after the treatment with the ligands, and we observe an increase of prenilinone, of course, because uh, these ligands affect the mitochondrial function, but also an increase of the progesterone and the hydrotestosterone. It is effective in the, in the diabetic neuropathy, this drug is strongly effective. I mean, it's able to affect the myelin protein for the potassium ATPase, nerve conduction velocity, thermal sensitivity, intral epidermal nerve fiber density. Another possibility, that is a model which is more recent, is the activation of LXR, I mean the liver X receptor. This receptor, the activation of this receptor, <coughs> Tanto urlo. 
the activation of this receptor is able, is able to promote the cholesterol utilization. I mean, uh, this experimental model has been uh, demonstrated in the adrenal cortex, and uh, with the uh, ligands of this uh, uh, liver e the LX receptor, you have uh, an increase of the cholesterol in the mitochondria. I mean, is able to interact with uh, the STAR, the name is steroidogenic active, active, the rapid activator, the steroidogenic. The cholesterol inside in the mitochondria is rapidly converted to the prenylalanine. You have an increase on your active steroids. So this occurs in adrenal cortex. We have tried to, to demonstrate this effect in the peripheral nerves. And in peripheral nerves, after the treatment with this ligand, we have an increase of enzymes and molecules which are important in the steroidogenic pathway, I mean the STAR for the mitochondria, the first enzyme which converts cholesterol in pregnenolone, and the 5-alpha reductase, I mean the enzymes which convert progesterone or testosterone into, met into metabolites. Indeed, by liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, after the treatment with this ligand, you have an increase of pregnenolone, progesterone, and the hydroprogesterone. And in diabetic neuropathy, we have also a beneficial effect on all these path parameters. So this demonstrates that not only the neuroactive steroids itself, but also drugs able to increase the level of neuroactive steroids directly in the nervous uh, structure are also protective agents. What is very interesting is that not only the neuroactive steroids exert beneficial effect on the neurodegeneration, but also neurodegeneration is able to affect the level of neuroactive steroids. I mean, this is a loop. We have demonstrated, uh, I wish only to show you some few examples. I mean, this is an experimental model for Alzheimer's disease. This is the triple transgenic uh, Alzheimer's disease mice. And we have analyzed the, the levels of several neuroactive steroids in the limbic region and the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex is there. This is the conversion from Mac to PC, I believe it. So we have. Uh, uh, we may observe that uh, the decrease of the upregulation of the level is depending on the region that you consider it. And that is very complicated to, to understand. I mean, if you consider the limbic region, you have an effect. If you consider the cerebral cortex, we have another effect. And you, you will see also this effect for the other experimental model. So, Prenialone, for instance, is decreased in the limbic region, but is not affecting the cerebral cortex. You have also upregulation. I mean, when you have a neurodegenerative heavens, we have not a decrease of the steroids, but you also, we may have also an increase on neuroactive steroids. And usually, this is evident in the acute phase of the neurodegeneration. I mean, in the acute phase of neurodegeneration, we have a tentative on neuroactive steroids to cope with the neurodegenerative heavens. When you have the chronic phase of neurodegeneration, we have a strong decrease of the neuroactive steroid levels. And also this occurs for isoprenyanolone. The same is for the other steroids. So here the message is that when you have a neurodegeneration in this experimental model, we have changes on neuroactive steroids. When you use, for instance, another experimental model, uh, like, for instance, a Parkinson model, I mean injection, the, the injection, the 6 hydroxy dopamine, we have changes in the striatum and the, cere and the cerebral cortex. Of course, these changes are different to what occurs in the Alzheimer's disease, and in this experimental model, we have only changes in prenyanolone for the striatum or the hydroprogesterone in both structures. And that is very interesting because the only observation which are present in, in the clinician study has been performed in the cerebral fluid, in the, in the spinal cerebral fluid. And the Parkinson patient have, in the CSF, have a strong decrease of the progesterone and these metabolites. So this is an agreement to what observed for in the patient. 
The same in the peripheral nervous system. I mean, uh, this is the, uh, the nerve crush injury. And f uh, if you compare, for instance, uh, uh, the, uh, the intact uh, sciatic nerve with the crushed sciatic nerve, you observe a decrease of pranelanone, dihydroprogesterone, and tetrahydroprogesterone. So, this set of experiments indicate that neurodegeneration is able to affect the neuroactive steroids level directly in the nervous structure. I mean, both in the central nervous system and also in peripheral nervous system. But if you consider it also the, in general, the neurodege neurodegenerative disorders and also the psychiatric disorder, in all this pathology, there is a clear gender difference. I mean, uh, for instance, in terms of incidence, in terms of uh, response to the therapy, in terms of symptomatology or outcomes. For instance, if you consider Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, and Parkinson, this is very different in male and female. So, why it is different? It is different uh, because uh, it is a problem of chromosome or sexual chromosome, or is, it is different from the hormonal environment. Of course, one possibility could be also for the hormonal environment. And when I say hormonal environment, I am an endocrinologist, but usually the endocrinologists consider only the plasma. It, of course, cannot consider it what happens directly in the nervous structure because it, it is not possible directly to know what happens in the nervous structure. So we have performed these experiments and we have analyzed what happens, of course, in the rodents, in the spinal cord, cerebellum, cerebral cortex, a peripheral nerve, the sciatic nerve, in comparison to what occurs in the plasma. So these are intact animals, and in this situation we have compared adult male with female, adult female. For female, of course, we have only analyzed one day of the estrocycles because it was uh, too, too difficult. I mean, we have considered proestrous days. And we have observed that, for instance, in the central nervous system, prenenolone is not sex dimorphic, but if you consider the progesterone and its derivative, there is a sex dimorphism. I mean, the levels are higher in female in comparison to the male. This is not the same in all cerebral structure. I mean, for instance, if you consider the dihydroprogesterone, the hydroprogesterone is sex dimorphic in the spinal cord and cerebellum, but is not sex dimorphic in the cerebral cortex. And if you consider the androgen, I mean testosterone and its derivative, or the, the hydroepiandrosterone, which is a precursor of the androgen, we observe that the levels are higher in male, but also, for instance, for the, the hydroepiandrosterone, these do not occur everywhere. I mean, it's only higher in male in, uh, in, male in cerebellum and cerebral cortex, but not in the, in the spinal cords. The pattern is still different in peripheral nervous system. I mean, if you consider the level of neuroactive steroids, in the, neuro, in the cerebral, uh, in the CNS, in comparison to the PNS, there is a sex dimorphism, but these sex dimorphisms do not reflect directly what happens in the central nervous system. I mean, in the peripheral nerve, for instance, you have higher level of pregnenolone in female, while in the central nervous system is not sex dimorphic. And the same, of course, for instance, for the free alpha diol on the hydropiandrosterone. The 70 beta estradiol, which is normally considered a female hormone, if you analyze in the nervous structure, is not sex dimorphic, but is only sex dimorphic in the peripheral nervous system. So, as an endocrinologist, we consider the plasma level. And we see that the the sex dimorphism in the plasma does not exactly reflect what happens in the central nervous system, in the peripheral nervous system. I mean, this is very important from a diagnostic point of view because usually we consider the, uh, the window of the plasma level 
as a, the window to what happens in the nervous function. But this is clear that it is, it is, it is true only for some steroids. For instance, if you consider the dihydroprogesterone, dihydroprogesterone is higher in female in this structure, is the same in male and female in cerebral cortex, is higher in sciatic nerve, but in plasma, we have higher level in male, not in female. So, as I told you, this is only some few slides which, which, are, uh, which I try to highlight the sex dimorphism in the uh, several neurodegenerative disorder. I mean, uh, for instance, if you consider the, uh, the Alzheimer's disease, epidemiological studies uh, have shown that there is a higher prevalence and in incidence in the women in comparison to the, uh, to the male, uh, at variance to what was in young male and the old female, mitochondria or young female are protected ag against uh, the increase uh, caused by the beta amyloid. Also, the, the plaque are different. I mean, uh, uh, higher plaque is observed in female than in male, or if you consider, for instance, the classic experimental model, uh, for instance, for the Alzheimer, the neurodegeneration uh, due to the kainic uh, acid, you observe that the female are more sensitive in comparison to the male, and also the female show also hippocampal neurodegeneration, enhanced astrocyte proliferation, higher level of BDNF. So the pathology, the outcomes of the pathology is extremely different. The same occur, occur in uh, the Parkinson's disease. Of course, I'm not an expert like Fabio, but uh, uh, I remember that you told me that was very con controversial, the first observation, that the incidence is great in men, but in women, but slightly. Okay, okay. A little bit, okay, okay. So the course of the symptom or uh, the response to the pharmacological treatment is gender difference. Usually also the, uh, the time course of the pathology is different. I mean, the women tend to be older than the men and the onset of the symptomatology. They present also different uh, outcome. They present tremor, dominant form, and uh, is associated with a slower disease progression, etc. Also in the experimental model, the features are very different. I mean, uh, this is a classical experimental model, the, the intoxication with MPTP, and uh, uh, there is a strong depletion of dopamine in, uh, in male in comparison to the female. The inflammatory process are different. I mean, uh, I wish to show you this, uh, this study, which have uh, observed the, the levels of TNF-alpha, interleukin, uh, interleukin 6, interferon gamma, interleukin 1b, and uh, of course uh, in male and female, but the, the pattern, the profile is very different. Uh, for instance, this is the situation at TNF alpha. Uh, the first panel is the situation in the male and the other in the female. Uh, you can see after 14 days, there is also an upregulation in male, which do not occur in female. The same is uh, uh, for the interleukin 1 beta. Uh, there is uh, also in this case, a second peak after 14 days, which do not occur in the female. Uh, this is interleukin uh, 6, the marine levels. The pattern is extremely different and also for the interferon gamma. So also these parameters are different in male and the female. Multiple sclerosis, multiple sclerosis, uh, uh, for this situation, I'm sure that multiple sclerosis is more frequent in female than in male. Uh, the disease is completely different in male and female. I mean, uh, usually the women have also the relapsing remitting type symptomatology. 
Indeed, the uh, female are more protected than the, the male. Uh, indeed, when the men have the multiple sclerosis, have also a worse prognosis, they are affected in older age and develop a more severe pathology in comparison to the female. F psychiatric disorder like the schizophrenia. The schizophrenia, the risk is, is comparable. Uh, but uh, uh, the sex difference occur in age and the onset in the course of the disease. Usually the men uh, you have experienced uh, first uh, the, the onset in comparison to the female, and uh, the men show a severe, uh, severe negative symptoms in comparison to the women. The women react better to antipsychotic therapy in comparison to the men. Autism, also, uh, there is a, 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 very, a very big difference in terms of uh, incidence. I mean, the ratio is 4 to 1. Uh, is, uh, the autism is more prevalent in male in comparison to the female. And the same of, uh, is also evident when you utilize, for instance, some experimental model. A classic experimental model for the autism is also the uh, animals, the transgenic animal for the reeling protein that I mentioned before. Also in the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system in diabetes, di diabetic neuropathy more frequent in men than in women. Uh, also, the outcome is different because the males develop uh, neuropathy before than the female. The neuropathic pain is completely different in diabetic neuropathy. I mean, uh, this is more frequent in female, but if you consider, for instance, some uh, electrophysiological feature, you see that the males are more affected than the female. The question was, all these gender differences in neurodegenerative disorder are related to neuroactive steroids? What do we know? We know that, for instance, uh, if you uh, analyze the uh, in female uh, rats and you analyze the fluctuation of the hormonal uh, steroids during the estrocycles, this also affects the response to the brain or pathologic insults. For instance, uh, Classical neurotoxic effect, uh, I mentioned before, is the injection in kainic acid. And uh, if you observe what happens in the intact female, this is different depending on the day or the estrocycles that you consider it. I mean, depending on the day of the estrocycles, we have damage or protection. For instance, if you, uh, if you uh, analyze what happens in the morning of the, estro uh, the estrus, we have no neuronal loss. But uh, if you analyze in the morning of the proestrus, I mean when the peak of the estrogen occur, we have loss of neurons. The same is after gonadectomy. After gonadectomy, you have loss of neurons. So the, sorry. So depending on the hormonal environment, we have also a different neurodegeneration. And this is also occur in, the, in clinical study. For instance, in the, in the Parkinson, if you consider in the, the premenopausal women with uh, symptom of Parkinson, uh, they, have, uh, they are worsen when there is the onset of the menses. I mean, when the estrogen levels are very low. Or if you consider, for instance, the uh, study on postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy, there is an improvement of symptoms uh, with uh, a worsening after the withdrawal. I mean, when we stopped the therapy, the hormone therapy, we have a worsening of the symptoms. And the same is also when you compare, for instance, uh, female after, before and after the gonadectomy. So, of course, on, on this basis, we have uh, tried to analyze what happens directly in the nervous system. I mean, when you induce neurodegeneration, what, what happens not only in the plasma, but what happens directly in the nervous system. I wish only to show you some few examples of different experimental models. I mean, this experimental model 
is in the real uh, realer mice, as I mentioned, the realer is uh, an autism model, and uh, we have analyzed what happens uh, to the testosterone and uh, its derivative, the hydrotestosterone, free alpha diol, and the estrogen, in the cerebellum, or male and the female. So, in, uh, in male, in the cerebellum of male, you have uh, an upregulation of the testosterone, and which is uh, associated with uh, a decrease of dihydrotestosterone and 70 beta estradiol. The same do not occur in female. I mean, as you can see, in female is always the same. So, what it has been hypothesized is that during the autism, or at least in this experimental model, but of course do not, does not uh, exactly reflect the feature of the autism, you have that the testosterone is more converted in 70 bit estradiol in comparison to the conversion in the hydrotestosterone. I mean there is a shift in the metabolism. Usually, in physiological uh, status, the testosterone may be converted into, an, into uh, androgen, more potent androgen, I mean the dihydrotestosterone, or in the estrogen. In this pathology, this metabolic pathway is, uh, is affected while you have an increase of this metabolic pathway. Multiple sclerosis. We don't know that there is a strong correlation with the sex steroids, I mean with the hormonal environment. Indeed, the multiple sclerosis is affected during the mistress, uh, menstrual cycle. The pregnancy have a beneficial effect on the of the multiple sclerosis, in particular in some phases of the pregnancy, and the menopause indeed have a worse effect in the multiple sclerosis. So changes in the sex steroid hormones affect the outcome of the multiple sclerosis, and vice versa, multiple sclerosis is able to affect the sex steroid plasma level. So what happens? in the central nervous system. In these experiments, we have compared what happens in the spinal cord in the AIA model and in comparison to what happens in the plasma. And these are the results obtained in male and in female. And we have considered the acute and the chronic phase. I mean, as I told you, usually the acute phase is considered a neuroinflammatory with a neuroinflammatory feature why the chronic phase is considered as the, the demilinating feature. In the spinal cord of the male, we have, ca you have very uh, important changes in the levels of all these neuroactive steroids we have considered. It is interesting, for instance, to know that you have a decrease of all these steroids, but you have an upregulation of tetrahydroprogesterone. These do not occur in the female. I mean, the acute phase of the male is completely different in terms of neuroactive steroids level in comparison to the female. And it is completely different to what happens in the plasma. And it is completely different to what happens in the chronic phase. I mean, during the acute phase of the, new, of the uh, AIE, you have an impairment on your active steroids levels that is different to what happens in the chronic phase. And if you consider the spinal cord, the pattern is completely different to what happens in the plasma. And from the diagnostic point of view, that is very important because we cannot consider the plasma level like a window to what happens in the central nervous system. Diabetic encephalopathy. The diabetes uh, is able to not only affect the peripheral nervous system, but also have an effect in the central nervous system. I mean diabetes uh, is also associated with uh, cognitive deficits, increase of dementia, stroke, cerebral vascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, and psychiatric disorder. And I wish to remember you that all these uh, uh, diseases are sex dimorphic. So it is, this is the pattern to what happens in the spinal cord, cerebellum, and cortex of diabetic animals. And 
we have difference, some, some similarity, but also some dissimilarity, depending on the steroids, in the male and the female. The pattern of the spinal cord is different to the cerebellum. It's different to the cerebral cortex. The only common feature, for instance, in the, in, is in the uh, testosterone and the hydrotestosterone. I mean, only in male, the spinal cord, cerebellum, and cerebral cortex, but not in female, you have a decrease of testosterone and the hydrotestosterone. <coughs> peripheral nerves, also in peripheral nerves, the situation is different in male or female. If you consider, for instance, uh, uh, other experimental model of peripheral neuropathy, like uh, the hereditary uh, peripheral neuropathy, this is an experimental model of the charcomery tooth. This is a model of charcomery tooth 1A. In this experimental model, like in the clinical, in clinical study, there is an impairment of these myelin proteins. This is an experimental model of charcomery tooth 1A uh, because uh, these animals are uh, overexpressing PMP22, these are transgenic uh, models, and uh, you observe that in the female, we have a decrease of uh, isoprenialone, still a conversion to MAC to DPC, this is the isoprenialone, and uh, in male, you have a decrease of free alpha diol. So, these results, that is worse, okay. These results indicate that uh, uh, neurodegenerative events are able to affect the neuroactive steroids level in the sex dimorphic way. So, what happens in male is different to, to what happens in the female. But the steroid hormones environment itself, I mean the steroids coming from the peripheral glands, are also able to influence the pathology. I mean, if you in, uh, uh, analyze the effort, for instance, in this uh, situation of diabetes, uh, in the intact animals and the gonadectomized animals, these are different. Of course, we expected a difference in the intact animals because I told you that uh, if you consider a clinical study, the symptomatology of diabetic neuropathy is different in male and the female. But if you, go, if you analyze what happens uh, in the uh, streptozotocin experimental model, uh, this, there is not a, a very clear difference in the control animals. I mean, the male and female animals, in terms of all these parameters, have, have the same feature. But what is very interesting is that what happens when you gonadotomize the animals, so you remove the steroid hormones coming from the peripheral glands, and you induce the diabetes. There is no difference in male. I mean, if you consider it castrated male animals and you induce the diabetes, the diabetes is the same, has the same feature with the intact animals. But if you consider what happens in the female, we have observed that gonadectomy in the female is able to protect the female animals from the diabetic effect. Of course, we cannot uh, to propose to gonadotomize the female patient and uh, to see, okay, now you are happy because you are gonadotomized, but you have not the possibility to have the diabetic neuropathy. But what is very important is in this experimental model is uh, to understand really what happens. I mean, the question was, because the, female, the gonadotomized female animals are protected from the diabetes. So we have analyzed what happens directly in the peripheral nerves. And if you compare the levels of the neuroactive steroids in male gonadotomized animals and gonadotomized animals with diabetes, there is no really the changes. There is only a small decrease of these steroids. But in the female, you have an upregulation of dihydroepiandrosterone, testosterone, and dihydrotestosterone. I mean, I wish to remember you that dihydroepiandrosterone is considered a precursor of the androgen. 
And of course, this is very surprising, because why, which is the reason? Because the uh, diabetic animals may upregulate the steroid levels directly in the nervous system. A possibility could be that uh, the female animals may try to, to cope with the neurodegenerative heavens. I mean, this increase is responsible for the protection. And if you analyze what happens in the, uh, what it has been observed in literature, we observe that, and this is very surprising, that the effect of the hydroandrosterone testosterone and the hydrotestosterone has been already analyzed, but has been already analyzed only in male and not in female. That is very, that is very common because the, the people in laboratory prefer to use the male because when you use the female, you have to consider, of course, the four days of the estrocycle. cycle. So it's more easy to work the, with the male. And also, I wish also to analyze that usually only the endocrinologist consider that there is the difference between male and female. Many laboratories which are not involved in the endocrinologic study consider the same in, of male and female, but it's not really, it's not, uh, it's not the same. So, in the diabetic animals, in, in gonadotomized diabetic animals, we have an induction in the, only in the peripheral nerves of the hydropandosterone, testosterone, and the hydrotestosterone. So, we have considered, oh my God, we have considered what happens after the treatment with the hydropiandrosterone in male, which has been already uh, published, but not on all these uh, uh, parameters, but in, in comparison to what happens in the female animals. These are intact female animals. So, and we see that generally the, uh, there is also a possibility of protective effect by the hydropiandrosterone in the male animals. But for instance, the hydropiandrosterone is completely ineffective on myelin protein. I mean, if you consider the expression of P0, PMP22, and MAL, the hydropiandrosterone is not effective. In female, the hydropiandrosterone is extremely effective. And also, if you consider, for instance, another parameter, like for instance, the nerve conduction velocity, we have also an effect in male, but in female is more potent. And uh, if you consider the thermal sensitivity, the thermal sensitivity, for instance, of steroids is completely ineffective in male, but is completely effective in female. So, which is the reason by which uh, we, we try to, to understand the mechanism of action of these steroids. Uh, to understand the mechanism of action of the hydropiandrosterone is not so easy because uh, uh, in general, as I mentioned, uh, the steroids are very promiscuous. I mean, depending on the cellular system may affect not only a single receptor, but may also affect different steroid receptor. And in particular, this is very clear for the hydropiandrosterone. But we have also hypothesized that the hydropiandrosterone may affect itself or may be also further metabolized because, as I told you, the hydropiandrosterone is a precursor of testosterone, the hydrotestosterone, and 70 beta estradiol. So we have analyzed, after the treatment with the hydropiandrosterone, what happens to the levels of the steroids in the peripheral nerves, in male and the female. And if you analyze in male, we observe that there is, of course, an increase of the hydropiandrosterone level. We injected the hydropiandrosterone, but there is also an increase of testosterone, an increase of 70 beta estradiol, an increase of, uh, a decrease of 3, beta, 3 alpha diol and 70 alpha estradiol. While, if you analyze what happens in female, in female there is no metabolism. I mean the female animals are not able in the peripheral nerves to metabolize the hydropiandrosterone. So, one possibility could be that, in pink, of course, we have the female. The hydropiandrosterone in female is not metabolized. And the possibility is that 
the effect that we observe, the protective effect that we observe uh, with the hydropian androsterone may, may be due to an interaction with the GABA receptor, MDA, sigma-1 receptor, and androgen receptor. So, of course, we have many possibilities. And that is the reason because for the pharmaceutical company is very difficult to immediately go to the steroid ligands be, because before we have to really understand and well understand what happens to the metabolism and then to concentrate the attraction, for instance, of mixed steroid ligands. That could be a possibility. In male, we have conversion of the hydropyandrosterone into testosterone. So testosterone is able to interact with the androgen receptor, but we have also changes in the 70 alpha and 70 beta estradiol. And these two steroids are able to interact with the two isoform of the estrogen receptor, the estrogen receptor alpha and the estrogen receptor beta. But we have also conversion to free alpha diol, and free alpha diol is able to interact with the GABA receptor and estrogen receptor beta. So we have protection in male and female. We have fully protection in female. We have less protection in male. But the mechanism of action is completely different in the two sexes. I mean, in the Female, we have only an effect of the hydropyandrosterone, while in male, we may have an effect of the hydropyandrosterone, but also of the metabolites. And this is only an example. We, we now, we are exploring, of course, with other laboratory, uh, the possibility to have a sex-specific therapy based on the neuroactive steroids. And because the people before considered the neuroactive steroids as a panacea, I mean, the, the neuroactive steroids are, of course, very potent protective agents, okay? But what is it, it is uh, maybe protective agents in male could be not in the female and the vice versa. For instance, one clear situation is the Parkinson model. In the Parkinson model, many laboratories have observed that, for instance, the estrogen are neuroprotective in male, but are neurotoxic in female. So we, we believe that, of course, we continue to propose with other laboratories the possibility of the protective agents with neuroactive steroids. But we have also to be very careful in order to understand whether treated with some neuroactive steroids, male or a female. So this may be gender medicine. In conclusion, okay. In conclusion, I show you, I believe it, that neuroactive steroids are important physiological regulators and also protective agents, both for the central and the peripheral nervous system. The levels, the normal level the intact, in the intact animals are different in the male and the female and are in differently affected in male and female depending, on for, of course, on the pathology. I mean, if you consider the Alzheimer, you have a pattern of effect. You have, if you consider the Parkinson, another pattern of effect. There is some pathology in which the neuroactive steroids are strongly affected, other pathology in which only some specific steroids are affected. But we believe that this modification, to understand this modification, is extremely important. It is extremely important because in one pathology, we have uh, uh, that the metabolism is affected. Of course, if you treated the patient with progesterone, and if the main effect of progesterone is not due to the progesterone itself, but to the metabolites of progesterone, and in this pathology, we have a defect of the metabolism, of course, we observe an inefficacy of the therapy. So, it's very important to understand what really happens. And, uh, of course, we, we believe, because we strongly believe to the gender medicine, we believe that also for the neurodegenerative disease, a psychiatric disorder, in future there may be the possibility to treat it with neuroactive steroids, but also in different ways in male and female. Thank you.